Well, good morning. Welcome to Park Boulevard Presbyterian Church. Today is Sunday, September 20th, and as always, it is great to have you with us. Today, we're continuing in our sermon series on the book of Acts, and we'll be in Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 47. The initials RSVP are familiar to most of us. We see them all the time on invitations, but RSVP is an initialism, which is derived from the French phrase, respondez, s'il vous plaît, meaning, please respond, requiring a confirmation in an invitation. We all see it on invitations, even if we don't necessarily remember exactly what it stands for. I watched an old episode of the TV show, The Office, recently. It was the one where two of the main characters, Jim and Pam, are getting married and the entire office staff head up to Niagara Falls for the wedding. Upon arrival at the swanky resort hotel where everyone is staying, the boss of the office, Michael Scott, comes to the hotel desk to check in and is told by the attendant that his name is not on the guest list and the hotel is all booked up. He answers that he must be on the list because a block of rooms has been reserved for the wedding party and guests and he was invited to the wedding. When asked if he had actually RSVP'd, he admits that he had not, and he didn't realize that he actually needed to. The whole concept was lost on him, and it turns out he was out of luck. He spends much of the remainder of the episode trying to find someone who will let him stay in their room to no avail. He finally ends up spending the night in the room with the candy and soda vending machines and the ice dispenser. Well. I've never had to sleep next to the ice dispenser, but I admit that I have blown off my share of RSVPs, sometimes with the result that I've missed out on some special opportunities. This is because I simply didn't take the RSVP seriously. I didn't think that I actually needed to respond. But sometimes our response is not just polite, it is essential. Our scripture passage today is all about the need for our response to the invitation that comes from God. I'll read now Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 37. Hear the word of the Lord. Now when they heard this, the crowd were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And Peter testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the good will of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Well, continuing on from our sermon last week, we remember that the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the gathered group of disciples, which numbered about 120 men and women, and they began to speak in different languages, each of them. There were multitudes of Jews who happened to be in Jerusalem at that time who had come from all over the Mediterranean world to celebrate the Jewish holiday of Pentecost. And a huge crowd gathered together because these people were hearing their native languages spoken by this group of spirit-filled disciples. Once a curious crowd had gathered, the apostle Peter stood up and began to preach the gospel to them, telling them the story of Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and finally, 
his exaltation to the right hand of God. Now the crowd who hears this is convicted by Peter's words. They are, in the words of Acts, cut to the heart. The words of Peter have penetrated, struck a nerve, and the crowd wants to know, what should we do? Well, this is a very important question because it recognizes that the gospel message requires from us a response. The people can't just walk away saying, that's nice. Gospel, the word gospel means good news. And the message of good news is that the kingdom of God has come near and is now accessible to all people through Jesus Christ. God has made Jesus both the Savior and the King of the world. Through Jesus, God has done everything that needed to be done so that we could be saved. Everything that is, except force us to receive Jesus Christ. And that is what is needed, not the forcing, but the receiving of Jesus Christ from, by each one of us. This is what we might normally describe as becoming a Christian. Unfortunately, becoming a Christian has become associated with simply a belief system, where if someone believes the right things, they are in. This is partly because our approach to faith in the West is very knowledge-based. What you believe is the most important thing about you. But it's also because of a well-meaning emphasis that many Christians have on God's grace. Grace, which means there's nothing that we can do to earn our salvation, because our salvation is a free gift of God. But the result has been that many of us operate with the understanding that what we believe is what really matters, and what we do is secondary or even unnecessary. But the New Testament actually gives us a very different picture of what it means to be saved. And the essence of it is all right here in this first Christian sermon. An active response to the invitation of God is required. And this response, I think, according to this text, has three parts. The first part of the response to God is repent. The people ask, what should we do? And the first thing that Peter says to them is, repent. Now, we might associate repentance with judgmental preachers, or we might picture wild-eyed, sign-carrying prophets outside the subway station. Or we might confuse repentance with penance, which means self-punishment in order to atone for sin. But while repentance does require an acknowledgement and even remorse for sin, repentance also includes the honest intention to change our ways. We can think of it as a 180 degree turn where we recognize that we're going in the wrong direction. We stop, we turn around, and we go in the opposite, the right direction. That is repentance. Now, repentance might very well involve tears and pain. That is implied in the description of the people when they said they were cut to the heart, they were convicted. When there is conviction of wrong for us, of the mess that we have made of our lives, of the evil that we have done, and the pain that we have caused to other people and to God, then we are beginning to repent. Sin is very real, and the Bible is very clear Every one of us as human beings have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Yes, it's true. Each one of us is a sinner, no matter what we like to think about ourselves. We can't receive God's forgiveness, which, by the way, God is eager to give to us if we don't believe that we actually need it. When we repent, we are admitting to ourselves and to God that we can't save ourselves, that we can never be good enough or worthy enough for God, and that apart from God, we are totally lost, left to our own efforts. As scripture says, the wages of sin is death. It's important for us to remember here that God's grace and forgiveness do not come to us based upon the quality of our repentance. In fact, they don't come to us because of our repentance at all. 
This is good because we can never be truly sorry enough to be worthy of God's grace. Instead, it's much more appropriate to say that we can only be in a position to receive God's grace and forgiveness when we repent. So repent, and the next thing that Peter says that the crowd needs to do is be baptized. In responding to the gospel message, we need to repent and we need to be baptized. Baptism, the Greek word baptisma, means literally immersion. And to baptize is to dip or to plunge, usually into water. Baptism was in use before Jesus as one of many expressions of Jewish ritual purification. But John the Baptist and Jesus' disciples baptized people as an expression of repentance and the forgiveness of sins. And baptism then became the ritual of entrance into the Christian church. Baptism is rich with symbolism. In addition to the washing away of sins, there is also the imagery of dying with Christ as one goes down under the water and then rising again with Christ as we rise up out of the water. Baptism is not magic. We don't believe in holy water that has power inherently or from being blessed by a priest or holy person. It's also not entirely accurate to say that baptism is merely symbolic, though. Our own church, the Presbyterian Church, considers baptism to be what we call a sacrament or a sacred act, along with the Lord's Supper, because it was something that Jesus instructed his followers to do. In baptism, we understand that we are actively participating in what God is already doing for us. Baptism is powerful because it is the response of a person to the grace of God in Jesus Christ. It involves a verbal and physical statement of faith, repentance, and commitment to Jesus Christ. It therefore becomes a statement of faith in Jesus Christ to God. We are making this profession of faith to God that we trust in what he has done for us. We also are making this profession of faith to those who are gathered around, the witnesses that we have faith in God. And we're finally making this profession to ourselves. When we go through baptism, we're actually making this profession to ourself of our faith in God, which is so important. This profession, this baptism, is actually crossing over the demarcation line between who we were and who we are becoming. The questions asked at baptism are typically threefold. Do you renounce the power of sin and evil in your life? In other words, do you repent? Do you trust in Jesus Christ as both Savior and Lord? And will you be Jesus' faithful disciple with God's help? In baptism, we not only claim a new status in Jesus, we're saved, but also a new way of life in this world. Jesus is our Lord and our King now. So we repent, we're baptized, and the third response is we enter the church. Now, it doesn't technically say this in the text, but if we read on, this is what happens. And I think that this is the natural result, the natural next step of repenting, being baptized, is we become a part of what Scripture calls the body of Christ or the church, the gathering of Jesus' followers. Now, this doesn't mean entering the church building or joining the official membership role of the church. The Greek word for church is ekklesia, and it literally means gathering. The church is the gathering of God's people, those who belong to Jesus Christ. In the words of the New Testament, we are baptized into Christ which means we are also baptized into his body, which is composed of all the people who belong to him. And we really don't have much choice in this. There are no Lone Ranger Christians. It's part of the deal of belonging to Christ, belonging to his people, belonging to one another. The book of Acts goes on to paint a compelling picture of the shared life of the believers. Briefly, our text says that they devoted themselves together to four things. 
The first thing is that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to learning and growing from the teaching of those who had experienced Christ firsthand. And they, were, they had the blessing of having the apostles right there in their midst personally. We, of course, have the New Testament, the apostles' writings. We are blessed also, which means we need to actually be spending time learning them together. The second thing, the gathering of Christians devoted themselves to the fellowship. And this is a word that has lost much of its meaning for us in modern times. We might associate it more with drinking coffee and eating cookies together after church in the fellowship hall. But think of the book or the movie, if you've seen it, The Fellowship of the Ring by J.R.R. Tolkien. The fellowship is a gathering together of a group, in this case nine travelers, who go on a journey together in which they must learn to trust and depend on one another in order to survive. And I think it's a great image for the church. We are called together into fellowship to share our lives and our faith together. The third thing is that the gathering of believers were devoted to the breaking of the bread. They shared meals together. They accepted one another into their homes. This also certainly refers to the continuing observance of the Lord's Supper, of remembering through the bread is broken and through the cup that is poured out that Jesus gave his body and shed his blood for us. They reminded themselves and one another of this again and again when they gathered together. And the fourth thing is that the believers devoted themselves to prayer. And prayer is the nervous system, if you will, of the body of Christ. The continuing connection and communication with God that's vital to the life of every believer and to their lives together. Interestingly enough, the New Testament doesn't really have anything to say about church buildings, worship services, church staff, budgets, or the other things that tend to take up so much of our energy. The church is the gathering together of God's people in Jesus Christ. And an indispensable part of our response to the gospel is our participation in the life of the body of Christ, Christ's church. Well, friends, finally, the gospel message is that God has overcome the power of sin and death through Jesus Christ. This is the good news. The good news that there is new and eternal life available to each one of us in Jesus Christ. But this message of good news requires more from us than our intellectual assent or interest. The gospel is an invitation that requires a response on our part. Like the father waiting for the prodigal son to return home, God is waiting for each of us with open arms, eagerly desiring to welcome us. But you and I must respond to the invitation. Our response to the invitation of God in Christ is threefold. Again, in the words of Peter, we enter into new life in Christ through repentance, through baptism, and through actively following Jesus in the body of Christ, the church. Of course, the life of a Christ, Christ follower is one of continuous response to God's grace and the movement of the Holy Spirit. And this coming to Christ is just the beginning of the journey and the adventure. But here today, in this passage, we focus on the initial invitation to respond to God's call. Each of us must respond. The question for each of us today is, have you responded to the invitation of Jesus?